Okay, Mark chapter 6. And I think it might come up on the screen so you can follow. <clears throat> he left there and came to his hometown and his disciples followed him. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were astonished. Where did this man get these things, they said? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? And how are these miracles performed by his hands? Isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And aren't his sisters here with us? So they were offended by him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honour except in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his household. He was not able to do a miracle there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. He was going around the villages teaching. He summoned the twelve and began to send them out in pairs and gave them authority over unclean spirits. He instructed them to take nothing for the road except a staff, no bread, no travelling bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on an extra shirt. He said to them, Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that place. If any place does not welcome you or listen to you, when you leave there, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. King Herod heard about it because Jesus' name had become well known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead and that's why miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, he's Elijah. Still others said, he's a prophet, like one of the prophets from long ago. When Herod heard of it, he said, John, the one I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had given orders to arrest John and to chain him in prison on account of Herodias, his, brother's, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. John had been telling Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias held a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, because Herod feared John and protected him knowing he was a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard him, he would be very perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. An opportune time came on his birthday when Herod gave a banquet for his nobles, military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When Herodias's own daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. The king said to the girl, Ask me whatever you want, and I'll give it to you. He promised her with an oath. Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? John the Baptist's head, she said. At once she hurried to the king and said, I want you to give me John the Baptist's head on a platter immediately. Although the king was deeply distressed because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to refuse her. The king immediately sent for an executioner and commanded him to bring John's head. So he went and beheaded him in prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When John's disciples heard about it, they came and removed his corpse and placed it in a tomb. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away by yourselves to a remote place and rest for a while. For many people were coming and going and they did not even have time to eat. So they went away in the boat by themselves to a remote place. But many saw them leaving and recognised them. And they ran on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. When he went ashore, 
he saw a large crowd and had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Then he began teaching them many things. When it grew late, his disciples approached him and said, This place is deserted and it is already late. Send them away so that they can go into the surrounding countryside and villages to buy themselves something to eat. You give them something to eat, he responded. They said to him, Should we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? He asked them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. When they found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he instructed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. He took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke the loaves. He kept giving them to his disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. Everyone ate and was satisfied. They picked up 12 baskets full of pieces of bread and fish. Now those who had eaten the loaves were 5,000 men. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. After he said goodbye to them, he went away to the mountain to pray. Well into the night, the boat was in the middle of the sea and he was alone on the land. He saw them straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Very early in the morning, he came toward them, walking on the sea and wanted to pass by them. When they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke with them and said, Have courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Then he got into the boat with them and the wind ceased. They were completely astounded because they had not understood about the loaves. Instead, their hearts were hardened. When they crossed over, they came to shore at Gennesaret and anchored there. As they got out of the boat, people immediately recognised him. They hurried throughout that region and began to carry the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. Wherever he went, into villages, towns or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch just the end of his robe. And everyone who touched it was healed. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Amy, for reading that so well. Uh, it, it doesn't feel long because Mark is so interesting, isn't it? There is just there's just so much happening in it. Uh, do keep the scriptures open in front of you. It's a big passage, um, and I won't be able to preach it all in detail. Uh, but if there's time at the end, I'll open up a space for Q&A as well as some maybe reflection or comment that, uh, that God might put on your heart that's worthy of encouraging our brothers and sisters in sharing. Thank you. Okay, um, now let me start. Uh, life, life sometimes feels like a game of whack-a-mole. Do uh, you know that kind of silly little arcade game where there's little, I don't know if you know it, I'll explain it to you, there's like the holes in this thing and little moles pop up and down and uh, your job is to grab this little, I don't know, padded hammer and, and, and whack them as fast as you can and you win the game by, well you never win, but you, you try and kind of keep them all whacked and under the ground. Uh, but what happens of course is you go through a kind of, you know, a little spurt of, you know, I've got, a, I've got this under control, I'm whacking them and then like just sheer chaos and they just start popping up all over the place and game over. Life sometimes feels like that, doesn't it? Uh, Like you have it in control of sorts, and then all of a sudden, chaos. Uh, And you can't tell sort of what's up, what's down. Sometimes you're winning, sometimes you're losing. Uh, One week, you're doing really well. The next week, not so much. Do do you feel that? Yeah. Sometimes up, sometimes down. If you're here at church and you feel like things are on the down, uh, I'm so glad you're here. Don't feel like you're surrounded by people who have got it together. 
If you see joy in this place, it's not because we have it together, it's because we found joy in Jesus. If you're on the up and you think you've got it all in control, Jesus will say to you today, he's going to minister to a need that you need exposed. (laughs) Whether you're up or whether you're down, you're welcome here and I believe Jesus has something important for, uh, for, for us to hear today. Uh, this little book that I came across a little while ago by Glenn Scrivener, uh, an Australian guy uh, in the UK now as an apologist and sort of public speaker to Christianity. Uh, he wrote this little kind of uh, Easter book called Divine Comedy or Human Tragedy, What is Life? Uh, and he says this, what, what is life? Is it a tragedy or a comedy? He's using the Shakespearean sort of language of comedy there. This isn't a question of whether life is hilarious, mostly it's not. It's about whether life is hopeful. A tragedy has joy, but it ends in pain. It's shaped like a frown, up and then down. A comedy has pain, but it ends in joy. It's shaped like a smile, down and then up. So what is life, tragedy or comedy? That is an interesting question, isn't it? Where are you in this story? In this frown or this smile? And maybe more importantly, where is your story headed? One of the things you're going to notice in Mark's gospel, as I've already alluded to, is just, it's not only sort of, it's not chaotic as much as it is just real. It is gritty. It is kind of just full of reality bites. My purpose in preaching today, as it is every time I preach, is to see that God's Word becomes alive in you, that He will transform you. Indeed, two weeks ago when I spoke on the parable of the sower, Jesus said, if you hear my word, if you welcome it, then that seed will grow inside you, will transform you, and you will bear much fruit for Jesus. That's my hope for us today, that we might welcome God's word, that it might become alive for us. Because what happens in this chapter is an up and down journey, showing us the reality of life and who Jesus is in the middle of that and even to us. Now, some of you have said to me, uh, Mike, I really like the way you sort of annotate the Scriptures on the screen. Today, I've gone level up, I've gone Microsoft Paint. Here is... <laughs> Here is the narrative journey of Mark 6. And I've put it deliberately messy, I'm mean, sort of honouring the sort of messiness of, of life in this chapter, but I want you to see just how up and down Mark 6 is, if you haven't seen that already when Amy read it. Mark is going to slam us into the, into the down parts and then thrust us up into the high parts. It's a roller coaster so that we might see in Jesus both a gritty humanity and a, and a, and a glorious divinity. So that by the time we get to the end, we're going to come to this phrase where Jesus says, Take courage, it is I. And I want that to have meaning, profound meaning for you. If it doesn't now, God willing, by the end, as we walk through this up and down journey with Mark. So, as I said, keep the Scriptures open. We'll see if we get time for Q&A at the end. Let us begin this roller coaster. Because at the end of the last chapter, remember Isaac preached last week, it finished with Jesus raising uh, Jairus' daughter from the dead. <laughs> that is epic. Because in that kind of Glenn Scrivener frown or or smile, every life ends in death. Which makes, you know, uh, perhaps to answer the question, life is a tragedy. And that is a tragedy to even say that, right? And there is Jesus raising a girl from the dead to say there is more than what you can see. There is more to life than death at the end as you know it. That is amazing. And so you expect right up the 5,000 people to kind of just gather straight then and there. Wow, Jesus, this guy raises the dead. There is more to life. I want that guy. And we'll get to 5,000 people, but it's not right now. What happens right now? (laughs) What happens now is Mark slams us into the reality of Jesus' gritty life as he goes to his hometown and he enters the synagogue for the last time in Mark's gospel. And he speaks there like he speaks all the time. And people are amazed, they're astonished, they're dumbfounded. And we've seen that before too. Where is this teaching coming from? Where does he teach with such authority? He is amazing. But this one's slightly different when they say that. Because the people saying that know Jesus. They knew Jesus when he was a little kid. 
They knew Jesus as he grew up. His family's there. They say, where did this man get these things? Where is this wisdom that he has been given to him? And how are these miracles performed by his hands? And then the shift, right, which retones everything. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't it that kid that lived down the road? (laughs) And they were offended by him. (laughs) The tragedy here is, wouldn't it have been nice for Jesus' mum his brothers and sisters, his friends, to be able to say, I always knew he was going to be great. You know what they said? They said, who is that guy? Who does he think he is? They were offended by him. There is Jesus, the King of kings, in their midst, and they were offended by him because they couldn't see who he really was. The tragedy here is the tragedy of the human heart, able to defend any position, even if it's just flat out wrong. <laughs> this guy is Stephen Crowder. You might have uh, seen him, you might not know who he is, but you might have seen him in many memes. He's sort of the king of memes. Uh, he's a guy who sits in, you know, often colleges in the States and, and sort of plonks this table exactly like this. And, and he, he writes a position on a big sign and he says, Change my mind. <laughs> And there he is, and he's got a whole YouTube channel now. He sort of had a go at acting. Uh, this is a bigger thing for him now, a YouTube thing, where he's just debating people. And, and you know, so I just went into the meme generator and just wrote in this. So he's, never, he's not appeared at a table like that. That's just a meme generator. Um, but, but you could imagine kind of Jesus' family and friends. Jesus is just a carpenter. Changed my mind. <laughs> I'm not convinced there's anything more. Well, what I love about this guy is he shows us a couple of things about the tragedy of the human heart. Uh, he, he, he shows us how, how often we are just so ignorant in the positions we hold to. He also shows us the, the culture wars that we are entrenched in. And, and, and lest you think we can escape those cultural wars by sort of just a battle of wits, it, it's more complicated than that. It, it's not just a head game, it, it's a heart game. The reason we find ourselves in entrenched positions is not because we've come to some supreme rational kind of conclusion, it's often just because our heart has latched onto that, our desires have formed around that, and that's far more complex. Richard Haidt, an uh, American uh, social um, psychologist, uh, Haidt as in H-A-I-D-T, not Haidt, H-A-T-E, uh, he wrote a book called The Righteous Mind a little while ago, and, and he, he helps us see the complexity here when he uses a metaphor to describe the relationship between the head and the heart as an elephant and the rider, the elephant being the heart. Fr- friends, we think we are so smart, but there is this little brain sitting on a massive heart elephant that's just kind of plowing through things. And over time, you know, we're able to, if we're well, train the elephant of sorts, the heart. But largely, we are are emotional, we are heart desire-driven. How on earth do you change the hearts and minds of people? How does Jesus, who no doubt would have been, oh, could you imagine, like so crushed by the rejection of his own family and friends, how is he going to change their hearts and minds? Well, he says, he says this, he says, a prophet is not without honour except in his hometown, among his relatives and in his household. He knows like the prophets of old that, Jesus, that God sent to his own people and who were killed and rejected, that he too will be rejected, especially by his own, those who are most familiar with him. Jesus doesn't really try and change their mind at that point. He even sort of casts a judgment on them and and sort of moves on. And we won't hear of Jesus' mother again until she tends to his body at the end of Mark's gospel. It finishes with this strange moment where Jesus was unable to do any miracles in that place. Unable? As in kind of was Jesus was sort of outdone by this? No, maybe not able is, is, is not helpful. Perhaps it's like there's just no point that they have seen Jesus, the King of Kings, they've heard Him speak, that they know of His miracles. Nothing is going to change their hearts and minds right now. And so He is just not open to showing them anymore. They will not see the kingdom because of their contempt, because of their familiarity, perhaps. 
And so he moves on. And that kind of not being able to do miracles, we're going to see, is in stark contrast to the end. Remember, Mark is an expert storyteller. We're going to see that the very few miracles that this chapter begins with ends with a, a kind of just crazy town miracles. But in the meantime, Jesus moves on and he goes around the villages teaching. Uh, but more than that, he goes on to initiate the, the triumphant commissioning of the Twelve. And so he's on to the next thing, and we're on that next high, as it were. And as the, as the disciples gather, Jesus sends them out two by two, and he gives them authority to drive out unclean spirits. He also gives us some strange instructions, right? He tells them not to really carry anything, so to be completely dependent on the circumstances they find themselves in. Why don't we do some, uh, some walk-up for a couple of weeks after after this service, and we'll just take, you got everything, you got, you know, let's have to take an extra shirt, no, no money. Just imagine that, right? That is, that is full on. He says, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that place, and if any place does not welcome you or listen to you, when you leave there, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. What are we to make of that? Well, their mission, their particular purpose ha has intent, it's not kind of just go out and just love people. It's not as kind of amorphous as that. It's actually go and, and tell people to repent and drive out demons. It, it has, a, has a sharpness to their mission because they were commissioned for a purpose. They're also to do it in complete dependence on God and in complete humility. It is extraordinary. There is an urgency here. If they find themselves in a place that is not willing to listen, just like Jesus has been in his hometown, they're not just to stay there and kind of to win them over. They're actually to, to shake the dust off as a judgment against them and walk on to the next town. It's much more difficult for us in our circumstances, you know, in a workplace, living amongst neighbours. If we find that people are not receptive to the gospel, just shake the, the dust off and, and storm out. I mean, that would be strange, right? I, I don't think we should take this exactly as a statement of how we should do mission. But I do think we ought to take this intentionality, this purpose, this humility, this dependence in, in the way that we live our life. I wonder if we're in danger of the opposite thing. That, that is, that we'll just live our life and be really nice people. And kind of whatever happens, happens. And, no, I think we should desire more than that. I think we should desire people to turn in repentance, to come to follow Jesus because of the way we've lived our life, the way we've shared our life, the words that God has given us. And so we kind of expect great things to happen for the disciples because, Mark tells us, verse 13, they drove out many demons, anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. And so there's this hint of, you know, Jesus has given them authority They've gone about and done this, and great things are happening. And again, we're expecting the 5,000 people to come back uh, to, to Jesus because of the great work they've done. <laughs> now, Mark's got another surprise for us, right? Because the outworking of this great work is that the news of Jesus spreads all the way up to political hierarchy. It heads all the way to Herod. Who is, a, who is a ruler of the principality in that particular uh, part of the Roman Empire. Uh, Herod Antipas is, uh, is his name, and uh, he's known throughout history. And, uh, and he hears about Jesus. So this is verse 14. King Herod uh, heard about... Um, ab uh, sorry, King Herod heard about it because Jesus' name had become well-known. Some said John the Baptist has been raised from the dead and that's why miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said he's Elijah, still others said he's a prophet, like one of the prophets from long ago. And when Herod heard of it, he said, John, the one I beheaded has been raised. And Mark's been sitting on this sort of flashback story all, all eight through Mark's gospel to here. So we haven't heard of John the Baptist since chapter one, right? Uh, the one who kind of set up uh, Jesus' ministry, the one who said, you know, I'm not going to be worthy to untie the straps of this guy who's coming. Uh, and yet Jesus, uh, he's baptized, um, he baptizes Jesus. And now Mark says, let me tell you what happened to John the Baptist. 
And he goes to quite an extent, you know, look, look at how to, all these kind of pockets of stories are quite small. John dedicates, a, Mark dedicates a bit of space here to talk about what happened to John, this flashback. Uh, since Herod's freaking out that John really has come back from the dead, he clues us in to what had happened. And it is a, again, it, it is a tragic story. It is a tragic story of, of the human heart and how depraved and how inward it is. John the Baptist, as he spoke in his ministry of repentance, was not shy in speaking about the powers that be. Uh, Mark tells us that he had spoken against Herod, who had married his brother's wife, and to kind of like keep that on the down low, of sort of as if it was going to be, but sort of just to keep that annoying voice, that, that judging voice to the side, uh, Herod imprisoned John. But that wasn't the end of the story, because there's this banquet, right? And, uh, and Herod's wife, his daughter, is, is dancing, and we can just imagine the kind of dancing that makes the crowd happy. And, and it, it's so happy is Herod by all of this kind of fanfare. It, he says to this girl, you can have whatever you ask, up to half my kingdom. That is an extraordinary offer, a ridiculous and foolish offer. Surely that has come straight from his desirous heart, his foolish heart. The girl goes straight to the mum and says, what should I do? The mum could have said, well, take half his kingdom. Awesome. Instead, let's get that annoying guy in the basement who's been speaking against me. Let's cut off his head. <laughs> and that's what happens. What, what a story. There, there is this great minister of the gospel, John the Baptist, and that is his end. It is no extraordinary life in many ways. It finishes as tragic as it could because of the ridiculous, foolish, depraved heart of Herod and those around him. Why would Mark want us to hear this? He doesn't even give account of it. He just sort of tells the story and moves on. Why is Mark waiting until now to tell us this? Well, he wants us to see, surely, that as the world might think it could shut down the message of the Word of God, that there is a silver line to this dark cloud, and that is this. Human hands cannot take over God's plans. The Word of God cannot be shut down. The message will go out, the kingdom will keep moving. And to make sure that we see that, Mark then wedges this story of John's beheading in between two highs, because very next is this, the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, John, uh, sorry, Mark cuts back to this real time as the disciples return with great news. They've gone out, they've done what Jesus said, they had Jesus' authority, many were healed, many heard about the good news of Jesus, many repented, and a massive, massive crowd is coming. But you see, before we get to the feeding of the 5,000, there's a really important scene that Mark wants us to see. That is this. Reading from verse 30, the apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, come away by yourselves to a remote place and rest for a while. And they go to eat and pray. That's important. Jesus does not go up and down like us, like the narrative. Do you get the sense that Jesus is in control here? that Jesus knows what's happening, that Jesus is actually setting the agenda. But ask yourself this, why, why does Jesus pray? If anyone had reason not to pray, I know we all have our reasons, right? But, but if, if anyone had their reasons not to pray, surely Jesus has the best reason. I am the Son of God. <laughs> I am God in flesh. Don't need to pray. <laughs> and yet He withdraws to quiet places frequently to pray. Now, I think he's praying here because he's about to face a specific temptation. That is the success of his ministry. I also think he's praying because, and I picked this little gem up from a guy called Pete Scazzero. He wrote a bunch of books, one of them called uh, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. 
I think Jesus is practicing being before doing. We live in a world that, that, that gets its sense of being from doing. But Jesus ensures that he grounds himself in who he is as a dependent child of God the Father, in his prayer, in his understanding of who he is as a child of God before he goes on to doing, especially doing great things. And then after this little quiet moment, he finds himself on a boat and then the crowd, such a large crowd, 5,000 probably more, with, uh, with, with women and children. It is huge. I just can't imagine being able to speak to such a crowd with that kind of modern technology, right? Uh, that is just an impressive feat. The first thing we're told about Jesus' response to this crowd is, in verse 34, He had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. You know, He could have easily especially given how we know that the narrative goes, he could have easily said, here is a massive crowd, they're in need right now, I got this. <laughs> Instead, his first response is, is emotional. He has compassion on them because he sees that even though they are in need of food, of kind of teaching, that they are in need of, of a shepherd. They are completely lost. They're doing these ones through life, up and down. They don't have direction. They don't have guidance. The shepherd language throughout Scripture is often one of sort of spiritual care. Uh, the kind of the shepherd is the one who, who, who lives with the sheep, who knows the flock, who cares for them, who defends them. They don't have that. All the leaders of Israel didn't act like shepherds. They didn't have the heart of God in them. They'd set up all these institutions of religion. Instead, Jesus has compassion on them. And then as he speaks with them, uh, he asks the disciples to, to get them some food to eat. <laughs> and they said, should we go and buy a year's worth of bread? Like, that's how much 200 denarii is, a year's worth of pay. That much bread and give them something to eat? Are you kidding me, Jesus? <laughs> how many loaves do you have? Go and see. He is calling them to be faithful with what they have. And when they found out, they said, five and two fish. I mean, that's a pretty poor effort from a crowd so big <laughs> to, to pull up five loaves and, and two fish. And Jesus says, that'll do. He took the five loaves and two fish and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke the loaves. He kept giving them to the disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them. Everyone ate and was satisfied and they picked up 12 baskets full of uh, pieces of bread and fish. And now those who had eaten the loaves were 5,000 men plus women and children. That is extraordinary. I wonder if the crowd knew the extravagance of this miracle. I suspect they would have because this is just amazing. Word travelled quickly, no doubt, through the crowd. But no doubt the disciples, who were very aware, were kind of just like... <laughs> Again, let's look at what Mark is doing here. This is an incredible story. But what happens next? Verse 45, immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him. Uh, that's not forceful enough, actually. Jesus forced his disciples into a boat. We've got to go. We've got to go right now. What happened between the 5,000 being fed miraculously and, and, and shoving the disciples in a boat to get cracking? Mark misses out what the other Gospels put in. I don't know why, actually. Mark's doing something there. I haven't really kind of cracked what he is doing at this point. But if we went to John chapter 6, this is what John says. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come, the crowd, intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew. I think Jesus was praying because he knew this would happen. He knew that the success of his ministry would draw a crowd, and even though he would act not for the sake of the success of his ministry, but because he had compassion on people, he knew that their response would be actually off. And so he withdraws, he does not let that happen, because as we do these ones, he still has his agenda, and their understanding of who he is and their agenda is not the same. 
Again, I'll say this phrase that I used a couple of weeks ago. We enter Jesus' kingdom. He does not enter ours. He will not let us play that game. And to prove it, there is this moment on the boat where uh, everyone else is in the boat, but Jesus decides to go on ahead and walk on the water. Well into night, the boat was in the middle of the sea and he was alone on the land. He saw them straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Very early in the morning, he came toward them walking on the sea and wanted to pass them by. That's very casual, isn't it? (laughs) Um, When they saw him walking on the sea... They thought it was a ghost and cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. (laughs) The disciples don't know what's happening again. I mean, they know what's happening, but they don't. Jesus could have said and does say in the revocations, you fools, why do you have so little faith? Instead, in spite of their terror and because of their terror, he spoke with them and said, have courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Then he got onto the boat with them and the wind ceased. They were completely astounded because they had not understood about the loaves, instead their hearts had been hardened. This is Jesus, the one who says, in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of their misunderstanding, he ministers to them and says, Have courage, take courage, it is I. Do you know what courage is? It's that that firm and and being being firm and resolute in the face of danger or adverse circumstances. I looked that up in a dictionary, right? Uh, Jesus has been doing that the whole time. He's able to say, take courage, take it from me. I'm giving it to you because you've watched me be courageous the whole time. While everything is going up and down, you have watched me be consistent You have seen me, be resolute, be true to who I am. Take it, because that's what I am. Jesus takes on the chaos of the world upon himself. He is the ultimate non-anxious presence. And he says to us, while we're terrified, while we're bobbing up down in the sea, take courage, it is I. The disciples didn't understand what had happened or barely even what is happening because they had hardened hearts. Again, we're back to the parable of the sower. They're they're kind of, their soil has has chunks of rock in it. They're kind of spurting up growth. Yeah, Jesus, we love you. We're awesome. We're following you. Also, got no idea. The disciples, they, they loved the marvel of what Jesus was doing in the feeding of the 5,000, particularly Mark makes reference to that. They're just like, wow, that was amazing. But they, they weren't open to who Jesus was and what He was actually showing them. They were seeing on the surface, they were seeing the tip of the iceberg, they weren't seeing what was underneath. Which is why, instead of being confident and joyful in Jesus and in what He was showing them, They were panicked and terrified. Friends, aren't we not the same? If we go back to the whack-a-mole, right? Our life is up and down and we're constantly trying to master it in our own effort and every time it sort of takes a left turn, every time the chaos reigns, we freak out, we're terrified. Jesus, fix this. (laughs) And Jesus ministers to our distress and says, take courage it is I. We too easily pursue what we think is triumph and we even ask Jesus to bless it in our prayers and we need to just, we need to be honest in in what we're praying for but we too easily pursue what we think is triumph. We too easily become anxious about avoiding tragedy and we ought, no one wants to be in tragedy but we live our lives stretched to these extremes pursuing triumph and avoiding tragedy how liberating it is to be faithful with what we have and be present with the one who is present right now, the one who says, take courage, it is I. Friends, if you are feeling stressed and stretched right now, 
I want you to take a breath and just be a good listener to, to Jesus as He speaks to you. I know what's happening. I know what's ahead. I've got a plan for you. I am with you. Jesus is able to minister to us in our weakness because He has walked with us through the up and the down. He knows what it is like to be human, to be stretched in all directions and yet to remain faithful and dependent on God, unlike us. And so He comes as the great mediator to actually bring us back together, to reintegrate us, to reconcile us back with the Father. How will He change our mind about things? How will He change the hearts and minds of His family, of those around Him who misunderstand Him? Well, only in the presence of the one who ministers to our greatest need will we change. And we're going to follow Jesus all the way up to the cross. And particularly at the point where Peter's going to say, don't do that. That's not a good idea. (laughs) I won't let that happen to you. And again, Jesus has a plan. And His plan is to minister to our greatest need. And that is our sinfulness. That is the way we have cut ourselves off from God. That is the way that we said, we've got a kingdom in mind here, God. I don't need you. Or could you just please bless what I'm doing? Instead, God wants us to be present with Him as a child of God. And no one is able to do that in their own strength. No one is able to cross that chasm. And He will melt the hearts of His family and friends. And of all those who have eyes to see, when He dies for them, when He dies for us, when He dies our death and then raises to new life, Only then will our lives of tragedy that end in death, and especially death before God, will we have our lives turned upside down, that we might find joy and peace that not even death can touch. This life will have many tragedies, this life will be messy, but Jesus will walk with you through the ups and the downs, and He will say to you, take courage, have faith, I'm showing you something of myself something that you will not see unless you trust me. Well, this chapter finishes as a bookend to the how it starts. But unlike the very few miracles he can perform amongst those with such little faith, in fact, with those with contempt, <laughs> Jesus crosses over from that scene of walking on the water. And, with pe- and, and, and sort of a whole range of people will see Jesus, just a glimpse of Him. They don't really understand who He properly is, and yet they come rushing towards Him. <laughs> God, I can't imagine how Jesus does this day in, day out. Just how many people pray for Him to, to work and to save and to kind of fix, and yet Jesus had compassion. And those who just touched His clothes were healed. <laughs> Surely Jesus' hope in the midst of all that is not only would they be healed, but they would be saved, they would find new life. Friends, my hope for you this morning, for anyone who hears these words, is that you would be ministered to by the one who gives life and life to the full, life for all eternity. That He wouldn't just fix your mere circumstances, but that He would minister to you in them and that you would know Him more and more. So whatever whack-a-mole game you're playing, there is something bigger at play here, and that is knowing Christ, the one who ministers to you in your need. Let me pray. Father, oh, our life looks like Mark 6. It is so up and down. And yet, you have set your eyes upon us, that you would love us, that you would give us new life, that you would forgive us. Father, help us to be faithful with what we have. Help us to see Jesus. Help us to take the next steps of faith, calm 
and at peace, knowing that you are in control and you are with us in all things. Amen. If you've got questions or comments, please uh, chat to me at the end. Thanks.